As Utah women, we are part of a remarkable community today, and we share a legacy with foremothers of the past. I run an organization called Better Days 2020, which is popularizing Utah women's history. The reason we are doing that is because there are some elements of Utah women's history that we believe can change the way we think about ourselves. For instance, did you know that Utah was the first place a woman voted under an equal suffrage law in the United States? Yes, good. Did you know that we had the first female state senator elected anywhere in the nation? We'll be talking more about her a little bit later on. And my personal hero, Emmeline B. Wells, who should be a household name in every home, met four US presidents in her work for women of Utah and the nation, among many, many other accomplishments. At Better Days 2020, we believe that knowing this, this knowledge gives us power. And in fact, we've tested the impact this knowledge has on students, elementary and high school aged students. And when we present them with these facts and with the biographies of some of these women and uh, what they were able to accomplish, their vision of themselves as girls or the girls around them skyrockets. So tonight what I'm gonna do is give you a very brief overview, a crash course in Utah suffrage history specifically. So the suffrage movement was the movement to give women the right to vote. It officially started in upstate New York in 1848, but it had its first triumphs here in the Western United States. And this year, as we're celebrating the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, which was one of the milestones, a significant milestone in extending voting rights throughout the nation, we wanna make sure that Utah does not get forgotten, that this Utah story is part of the national narrative. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about it tonight, and I'm gonna tell you what we learned from it and how we can be inspired by it. So on February 14th, 1870, so February 14th, that's just about two weeks away, so remember that date, a woman named Sarah Young, a 23-year-old school teacher, cast a ballot in Salt Lake City in the first election open to women under an equal suffrage law. Wyoming Territory, next door, had passed legislation already granting women to, the right to vote. But Utah's territorial legislature followed suit very quickly, and we actually had two elections in which women cast, the vote, cast a ballot before Wyoming went to the polls. This first vote happened in this building called the Council Hall Building, which you might recognize because it still stands across the street from the Utah State Capitol Building. Not only did we have the first women, Sarah Young, led by Sarah Young, to cast ballots in the modern nation, we had one of the leading suffragists of the Western United States. Emmeline B. Wells edited The Woman's Exponent for almost 40 years, and which this newspaper ended up being one of the longest running suffrage newspapers in the nation. It was hugely influential. Emmeline herself, as I mentioned, met four US presidents in her work for women. She also became a good friend of Susan B. Anthony's. When the women of Utah first voted in 1870, they were such an anomaly in the nation. They also had a very strange motivating factor for wanting to vote. And that was the fact that some Utah women at the time, who were members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, were in plural marriages. And this was considered barbaric by the Eastern government and by Eastern culture, by most of the rest of the American culture. And so they were considered this great oddity out in the West. Most of the suffrage leaders would not pay attention to the Utah women. They thought they were too much of an anomaly. They didn't want to touch this strange marital practice that had resulted in such a bizarre uh, um, expression of independence and intelligence. They couldn't reconcile those things. But Susan B. Anthony was just crazy enough to embrace the Mormons, and she did. She thought all marriage was oppressive. It didn't matter if it was one man or many men. Or... And so she just took the Mormons in all their weirdness 
and celebrated them as having achieved something that no other American women, woman had achieved. She invited Emmeline to come to Washington, D.C. to testify in front of Congress that children were not being abandoned, homes were not being abandoned, women were not turning into men by their presence on the public stage. In fact, the relationship between Susan B. Anthony and the women of Utah was so close that Susan B. Anthony visited Utah on several of occasions to congratulate the women of Utah on their unique accomplishment. This picture that you see here was taken in 1895 at the Rocky Mountain Suffrage Conference at Susan B. Anthony and Anna Howard Shaw, two major national leaders sitting with women from Wyoming and um, Colorado in addition to a, the main delegate from the main delegation from Utah with Emmeline Wells right there behind Susan B. Anthony. Additionally, the women of Utah, who were famous for their homemade silk, gave uh, Susan B. Anthony a bolt of this black famous Utah silk on her 80th birthday. Susan B. Anthony turned it into a dress, which now sits in her bedroom in the Susan B. Anthony Home and Museum in Rochester, New York. It sits in that place of honor because she declared it her favorite piece of clothing because it was made by free women. Emmeline Wells leaves a tremendous legacy that every one of us in Utah should be aware of and that we should be inspired by. But she isn't the only one whose name we should know. Martha Hughes Cannon, Dr. Martha Hughes Cannon, became the first female state senator anywhere in the nation when she was elected in 1896 to the Utah State Legislature, she ran against and beat her own husband, <laughs> as well as her mentor, Emmeline B. Wells. You can see this picture of the, the first Utah State Legislature here with Martha standing in the front, along with two other women who were the legislative secretaries. Happily, Martha will become more of a well-known name thanks to uh, the support of the Utah State Legislature, which is sending a statue of Dr. Martha Hughes Cannon to the U.S. Capitol building at the end of this year as the 10th woman to be represented in the National Statuary Hall in the U.S. Capitol building. When Utah became a state in 1896, it entered the Union as the third state to include suffrage in its constitution. In a dramatic twist of history, the ability for women to vote here in Utah had actually been taken away from them 17 years after they first voted by an act of Congress. And so when Utah became a state, it was a really big deal that suffrage was included back into the Utah State Constitution. It was all men who wrote the Utah State Constitution, and it was up to men, as it had been in 1870 when the territorial legislature first gave women the right to vote, to decide that women should have this privilege. The Utah women went on, after they achieved voting rights for themselves with statehood, to support the national effort to extend women's voting rights to the rest of the country. Here we see Emmeline Wells with Senator Reed Smoot and a delegation from the East standing in front of the Joseph Smith Memorial Building, which at that time was called the Hotel Utah, advocating for a national amendment. When Emmeline was 96 years old, she finally saw the amendment come to pass. Susan B. Anthony, unfortunately, had already passed away, and Emmeline was one of the members of the original Utah generation that had been involved in this movement for decades to actually see the amendment become a reality. In 1920, the barrier of sex to voting was taken away. As this political cartoon from the era suggests, the momentum for that 1920 amendment came largely from the Western United States. The work was not done, however, and in 1920, there were still a lot, lots of opportunities to extend those voting rights even more, particularly to communities of color and to Native American communities who were not considered citizens at the time. Additional legislation was required throughout the 20s, the 30s, the 40s, up until 1965 with the Voting Rights Act. And those discussions continue 
even today? Who is a citizen and who has the opportunity to participate in our civic life? But we can celebrate the fact that some of the initial kindling for that national suffrage movement happened right here. So, what do we learn from this history? Hopefully you've learned something that surprised you and delighted you and caused you to look at yourself a little bit differently as a Utahan. But there are some specific lessons I think that this story teaches us. First of all, the reason we talk about the suffrage movement, the reason this year is important is because it was never just about voting. The suffrage movement was a platform on which American women could first move from the domestic sphere into the public sphere. The movement gave them opportunities to organize, to research, to, to collect information through petitions, which were really the only political tool available to women before this time. It gave them the opportunity to work together, to fight with each other, to disagree, to comment publicly. And this is what the movement represents to us as women and as people today. Without this movement, um, the work of all of these additional women would not have been possible in the 150 years since that first vote. Every woman that has taken a step to participating in civic and public life owes a debt of gratitude to these original Secondly, Utah men and women worked together. They worked collaboratively to achieve their goals. This wasn't the case in every place in the country that the suffrage movement touched. In Utah, as I mentioned, the women were relying on the men, both in Utah territory and when Utah became a state, to grant women this right. Um, and the men did so, for the most part, unanimously and gladly. Um, they had external pressures that caused them to unite internally as a single cohort. Other places, it was very much of a men versus women. Um, and and we, we experienced a different tensions and different forces here in Utah. In fact, at the Utah State Constitutional Convention in 1895, I'll let you take a moment to, re to read this. One of the delegates, Franklin Richards, said that he thought that the, um, the inclusion of suffrage in the state constitution would prove to be the brightest and purest ray of your, Utah's glorious star. It will beckon our sister states and territories upward and onward to the higher plane of civilization and the fuller measure of civil and religious liberty. I will ask you to answer quietly to yourselves if you think we've lived up to Franklin Richards' vision and legacy. Utah women were neither pawns nor militants. History is complicated. People are complicated. And this movement in microcosm represents that messy history is usually accurate history. Clean history is too suspect. People are diverse. They are complicated. We have here two women who fought, who were Utah uh, residents who fought against Utah women receiving the vote for various reasons. They fought against some of the leaders of the movement. They fought against each other. Uh, they were diamond cutting diamond, as Emmeline Wells described them. Precious, precious, worthy souls cutting against each other, trying to achieve a glorious end, but disagreeing about how to go about it. This is, of course, something that we experience today. So what do we learn about ourselves today from this story? We can take away the fact that because they were visionaries and dreamers, they were able to see solutions earlier on and more radically than other people around them were able to see them. We can continue this legacy and this spirit today by seeking for audacious solutions to national problems, to our local problems, 
and having the courage to take risks, as our foremothers did, and magnifying the full range of possibility and potential for us as women. Our early Utah community, they saw the potential of women, and the women of this movement accomplished everything they did because of the support of their community and not in spite of it. We can be the kind of community today that also supports the development of the full potential of our women as they support their families, as they gain education, and as they develop their full characters. Lastly, a small group of women from a backwater desert in the Western United States punched above their weight in the national dialogue. They demanded that they be able to speak for themselves, that they not be spoken for. When the women of Utah felt threatened by governmental actions back in Washington, D.C., they formed one of the largest protests in U.S. history. Per capita, it may remain the largest protest in U.S. history to date. 15% of the entire population of the territory participated in this protest. They made sure that they were speaking for themselves and that they were being heard. Today, we continue to have an outsized voice on the national stage that belies the size of our state. And our women continue to be needed as we represent ourselves as Utahns to the nation. These women are our heritage. At Better Days 2020, we are committed to telling their stories because we believe that they have been buried for too long. We need to know these stories. The nation needs to know these stories. And this year, as we celebrate the first female vote and the centennial of the 19th, 19th Amendment, we have a unique opportunity to bring these women back to life. Thank you very much.